Kelly, or Kelly, or even Kelly. When talking about Survivor, it's hard to think of a name that has carried more weight than Kelly. Big blindsides, idle plays, even rule changes have all been linked to this one name. But Kelly isn't simply one person, but rather 10 people, each having played the game across various eras of the show. These players have been behind some of the biggest changes and evolutions of the game that we have ever seen. And yet, despite the impact that Kelly's have had on Survivor, none of them have ever won. Along the way, each of them have met their own downfall. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about their story. This is the history of Kelly's on Survivor. Our story begins in Borneo, season one of Survivor, this crazy social experiment where we have our first Kelly, Kelly Wigglesworth, and this Kelly seemed poised to do pretty well, considering she was pretty young and she seemed to get along with a lot of people on her Toggy tribe. And while Richard Hatch is remembered more today for creating the alliance on Survivor, really he was not the first to create an alliance. As we saw Kelly, along with Stacy and Sue, create an alliance early on that seemed poised to do well. But then obviously we saw at the second tribal that Toggy went to that Stacy was voted out in order to keep around Rudy. Even so, Kelly and Sue remained in lockstep and created what we know now as the Toggy Alliance, pulling in Richard and Rudy to essentially dominate a lot of the game. They got to the merge and took full advantage of Bagong's unwillingness to create an alliance, really coordinating their votes to send out Gretchen, the Bagong leader, in a four to one to one to one to one to one to one vote and capitalizing off Sean's uh, alphabet strategy, they were essentially able to get the majority soon thereafter, picking up the Bagongs one by one until it was eventually just the four of them left. But it was far from a simple ride to the end as Kelly started to question the morality of an alliance herself as she saw all this play out. She compared it to going over to the dark side, and eventually she did separate herself from the Alliance. While she never votes against the Alliance, she openly rejects the Toggy Alliance to the point where she even becomes a target once it's down to just the original Toggies. Even so, Kelly does win out from this point, winning the next couple of immunity challenges. At the final four, she initially sides with Sue to vote out Rich, However, once that goes to a tie, she flips on the revote, sending out Sue in tow. And eventually, Kelly does win final immunity and has to make the choice between Rudy and Rich. Kelly ultimately chooses to take Rich to the end. And just like that, she was there at the very first final tribal council. Now, coming into it, she was definitely the underdog where despite her winning some challenges and despite her being less open to alliances down the stretch, the Pagongs didn't really respect her all that much and were largely voting for her as a way of opposing Richard. But that's not to say that Kelly was a fan favorite on her own, as we even saw Sue Hawk stand there before Rich and Kelly and really dig into Kelly and in what is now known as the Snakes and Ratchet speech, Sue not only told Kelly to her face that she was voting for Rich, but dug deeper, saying that if Kelly were ever sitting on the side of the street, dying of thirst, that Sue would not give her a drink of water. Absolutely brutal. But even though this actually netted her some votes, getting Jer Jervis's vote along the way, it was not enough to overcome Richard's 4-3 jury advantage. And with that, Richard became the first sole survivor meaning that Kelly Wigglesworth had come just one vote short. It was still a strong outing for the very first Kelly, and definitely laid some promise for what future Kellys might present, and who knows what could happen from there. It didn't take long for Survivor Production to try once again with the Kelly experiment, just one season later in the Australian Outback, where we were presented with Kelly Gleason, or as you know him as, Kel Gleason. Placed on the Ogurgo tribe, he seemed pretty poised to do well given his military background. However, things didn't quite pan out that way, as he was definitely pretty aloof socially, failing to build many connections with the Ogurgo tribe, and while they did win that first immunity challenge, 
It wasn't long before he was on the chopping block, largely due to a particular incident where he was caught chewing something by Jerry, which was widely believed to be beef jerky that he had smuggled in. Now, while Kel denies this, saying that it was simply a piece of grass, it wasn't enough to convince the tribe, and when they had to go to tribal council, he was only the second boot of the season. Definitely a downgrade compared to Kelly Wigglesworth, but based on the fact that they brought another Kelly in so quickly, you could tell that Survivor production was determined to make a Kelly win Survivor. And that was reflected in the very next season where they had another Kelly, this time in Kelly Goldsmith. Kelly Goldsmith was an interesting prospect. Sort of similar to Kelly Wigglesworth, she was a bit on the younger side and was placed on the Baron tribe, which is definitely remembered today as the more dominant tribe. And early on, she was definitely showing some promise, being in the majority on some early votes, and in general just being a likable presence. But then, Survivor Africa gave us our very first trite swap, where she was placed onto the new Samburu tribe, which was split 3-3. Even so, she made the most out of this, and was a pivotal figure in figuring out that Lindsay was the one Samburu who had the most previous votes against her. And at this point in Survivor history, previous votes were the deciding factor in a tiebreaker. And this knowledge allowed the old Boron contingent to gain the numbers when they ultimately went to Tribal Council, stacking their votes against Lindsay and making it so that she would go out in the tiebreaker over Kim Johnson. It was definitely a notable moment for Kelly Goldsmith and by extension, her fellow Boron members. But then we get to the merge where things started to fall off the rails. Now granted, there was an early consensus target in Clarence, and it did seem to be a straightforward vote. However, T-Bird did tell Clarence that she wouldn't vote for him, and instead threw her vote onto Lex. This in turn caused Lex to go on a rampage basically, trying to figure out who had thrown their vote onto him. And despite Kelly Goldsmith coming off as a pretty loyal Bara member for much of the game, Lex ultimately put all the blame onto Kelly and made it his mission to target her at the next opportunity. This in turn caused Kelly to target Lex, basically creating a self-fulfilling prophecy on Lex's end. However, it wasn't enough for Kelly to overcome and she was ultimately the next person voted out, becoming the first member of the jury. Obviously, not the best showing in the world, especially compared to Kelly Wigglesworth, but on the other hand, she did at least make the merge, and she definitely showed some flashes of strong gameplay, particularly with her handling of the previous votes. However, as it stood, we remained 0 for 3 with Kelly's winning the game. And it wouldn't be for another 14 seasons before we see another Kelly get her chance to play. By now, it was Survivor Gabon. The show was now in the HD era, and here we have Kelly Zarnecki. Kelly was another interesting prospect coming into it. However, she wouldn't be nearly as successful as Wigglesworth or Goldsmith, as she was immediately on the outs early on, losing one of her closest allies in Paloma when Coda went to their first tribal council. But then she kind of got a blessing in disguise once the tribe swap happened, where she was swapped over into what seemed to be a minority group, However, she was also paired up with Jackie, who was a former member of the Onion Alliance that had taken out her ally. And while Kelly was considered a target by the Jackies of the world, she was also a key swing vote by Ken, Crystal, and GC, the original Fong members. And through that, Kelly was able to flip, blindsiding Jackie in the process. And after GC really proved that he was unwilling to play the game moving forward, that gave Kelly another easy target, allowing her to scrape on by through another round. But before long, she was the next target, and this time there really wasn't much she could do, namely with Maddie and Ace flipping over and in the process picking up Sugar to take out Kelly in a pretty unceremonious vote. And with that, Kelly Zarnecki was a pre-merge boot. Our next Kelly comes just two seasons later in Survivor Samoa, this time we have Kelly Sharbaugh. Kelly Sharbaugh was another interesting figure, being placed on the dominant Galoo tribe, which essentially dominated most of the pre-merge challenges, allowing Kelly to skate on by. Now yes, they did attend one tribal, where it was a pretty easy vote for Yasmin. However, it was not entirely smooth sailing as we saw this gender divide break out over the men and the women on Galoo, 
which only worsened once their leader, Russell Swan, was medically evacuated. Even so, things seemed to be working out pretty well for Kelly, where at the merge, her original tribe had an 8-4 to four numbers advantage, which seemed to be pretty insurmountable. But even with the men-women divide, it did seem like the Foa Foas were w more willing to work with the women at that first vote compared to the men. And sure enough, the first tribal after the merge went pretty well, where they not only take out Eric, who was the leader of the men, but they also flushed Russell's idol. And considering that an idol was one of the biggest threats to the Galu steamrolling the Foa Foas, it did seem like things were going to be pretty smooth moving forward. I mean, after all... Considering that no one had ever before found an idol without a clue, and considering that Russell had just wasted his idol, thinking that the vote wasn't going his way, surely there was no way that anyone could just find another idol immediately afterwards, and especially not without a clue, right? Well, it was time for the glues to sit together and take out Russell. The votes came in, and sure enough... I ain't finished playing just yet. Keep hope alive. That's right. Despite all logic, Russell had managed to find another idol just days after playing his at the previous tribal. In one swift move, Russell canceled out all seven of the Glue's votes against him. And who did a Voa Foa's vote for? That's right. And just like that, another Kelly bit to dust. Admittedly, I don't think this Kelly would have won the game, as despite her being in a strong position within the Glues, I did feel like Monica and Laura were in a better spot within the women's contingent, and I felt like they would have been a bit more likely to win the game compared to Kelly. Even so, this idle play ensured another early exit for Kelly. We only had to wait two more seasons to have the next Kelly on Survivor Nicaragua, only this time, they decided to cast not one, but two Kellys. Even crazier, they decided to put both Kellys on the same starting tribe, LaFleur. It made things a bit complicated, but they came up with a good way around it. Kelly Bruno would simply be known as Kelly B, while Kelly Shin, who was known for her purple highlights, would be known as Purple Kelly. Kelly Bruno was an interesting character given she was only the second amputee in Survivor history following Chad Crittenton from Survivor Vanuatu. Initially, Kelly B decided to hide her prosthetic leg, fearing that it would be a liability against her game, but it quickly became apparent that doing so would have been more trouble than it was worth, and thus she decided to reveal it to her tribe. For the most part, people were supportive of her plight, Although, there were certainly a few people that saw her as a big threat, namely Nayanka Mixon. Even so, Kelly B found herself in the Majority Alliance, even being included in Shannon's alliance. And while Shannon proved to be a loose cannon, making himself an early target, Kelly, along with Benry, decided to flip at that first tribal, causing her to be in the Majority there. And even so, she was still in a good spot for a lot of it, even with Nayanka trying to target her at every opportunity. Unfortunately for Kelly B, she was eventually swapped into a pretty bad position, and while she did attempt to target Marty, who was the leader of the opposite side, we did see the majority come together and split the vote against her, voting her out unanimously on the read vote. So on the whole, Kelly B was definitely an interesting figure, but another early exit for a Kelly. But then we had to talk about Kelly Shin, or Purple Kelly, who was a bit absent for a lot of the game. While she was in the majority, much like Kelly B, she was noticeably quiet on the show, almost deliberately so. Makes you wonder why. I mean, she didn't seem like the worst player in the world. Although with her confessionals about how you can milk cows, I mean, it doesn't bode much confidence. But unlike Kelly B, Purple Kelly was able to get her way to the merge, and from that point on, she was in the majority, being able to get through a lot of those votes. But by day 28, it was pretty apparent that things were not well with Purple Kelly. The elements had gotten to both her and fellow castaway Nyanka, and both of them were about ready to quit the game. Now, we never saw this on the show, but it is widely believed that the producers did not give Purple Kelly enough clothes as they had cast her to be a pretty face, and with that, only allowed her to wear a bikini. And while Fabio was kind enough to lend her his jacket, 
it wasn't enough to protect her from the elements where it often got cold and she was left pretty miserable. And at that next reward challenge, they both announced to Jeff that they were about ready to quit the game. Jeff wasn't thrilled about this, but he did give them the day to come to their senses and he convened a special travel council later that night where they would each get to make a final decision. But even with that extra time, neither Nayanka or Purple Kelly changed their minds and they both quit the game at once with Nayaka going out in 9th place and Purple Kelly going out in 8th. Both of them were still allowed to serve on the jury, largely due to a precedent set by Janu quitting the game in Palau after the merge. However, this sparked a rule change where in future seasons, contestants that quit the game during the jury phase could be removed from the jury at the producer's discretion. Additionally, it is widely believed that Purple Kelly's decision to quit sparked such an outrage from the production team that it led to Purple Kelly having such a dodo edit, which even coined the new term purpling for contestants that were consistently under-edited despite making deep runs. Despite the show's efforts to bury her, Purple Kelly is remembered today as one of the most unforgettable, forgettable players in Survivor history. She was so under-edited and so buried in the edit that people recognized her and on top of that, people see the effect that she has had on Survivor history, largely due to her decision to quit the game. And despite the producers burying her because she would quit the game, I really think that her quitting the game probably propped up her legacy far more than it would have been otherwise. And while she failed to win the game, Purple Kelly was yet another valuable addition to the Kelly roster. It would be another eight seasons before we have another Kelly, this time coming in San Juan del Sur, which was one of the show's blood versus water seasons. And here we had Kelly Wentworth coming into the game with her father, Dale. Kelly was an interesting addition to the cast as she was placed on the Hunapu tribe, which did dominate a lot of the early challenges. Kelly proved to be a pretty strong and social player for the most part, although she still got the attention of certain players, particularly Drew Christie. We saw during the fourth round of the game that Drew even went as far as to throw the immunity challenge in order to target Kelly. And while this could have been a serious danger spot for Kelly Wentworth, it was ultimately Drew Christie who dropped the ball here. Drew gunned hard for Kelly. So much so that I actually rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And he wasn't exactly keeping me in a secret either as he was literally campaigning to vote her out when she was standing just a few feet away. I mean, that's subtle gameplay. Sure enough, the entire plan backfired and Drew was voted out pretty handily, saving Kelly for another round. We then got to the swap where Kelly was reunited with her father Dale. However, this was also a death sentence for her where both her and Dale became quick targets on her tribe. And while Dale seemed to be getting more of the heat between the two, Kelly was the one who paid the price as she was taken out in a 3-2-2 vote at the first tribal, sending her out in pre-merge. And to add a cherry on top, Dale's voted out immediately afterwards, sending out both Wentworths in twit fashion. On the whole, Kelly Wentworth was a bit disappointed by her run here. Certainly, she expected more. And as far as she knew, she would probably never get another chance to play this wonderful game. Our next Kelly comes just one season later on Survivor Worlds Apart. Kelly Remington, noted for her background as a New York State Trooper, was picked on the Blue Collar Tribe as Kameka. And she was in a pretty good spot for a lot of the pre-merge, where she was part of the Majority Alliance, where her and Mike were even the swing votes at the only tribal that they attended before the swap. But then the swap came, and Kelly was put in a very bad position. She was the only blue-collar member to move to the no-collar tribe, and through that, she should have been dead to rights. However, she was able to join the no-callers at their first tribal and vote out Max, and her fellow Eskimeka tribe even went as far as to throw the next challenge to help her stay in the game, which really shows the level of loyalty that she had towards the Blue Collars. Unfortunately, her luck did run out at the merge when her side did try to vote out Jen Brown, only for her to pull out an idol and for her to be the target as a result. On the whole, Kelly did play a very good game on Worlds Apart, but she was sniped out just short of the jury phase. Later on, at the reunion for Worlds Apart, it was announced that the next season would be a second chance season, where the cast would be decided by a public vote. Voting took place in the episodes following Kelly Remington's boot, and while she herself was not on the ballot, there were two other Kellys that the people could choose from, 
two familiar Kellys. We have Kelly Wigglesworth, remember her, way back in Borneo? And Kelly w Wentworth, who was a very recent addition to the Kelly roster. And in a coincidence for the ages, both Kellys were voted in to the cast. And just like that, two Kellys, once again, were represented on Survivor. From a viewer perspective, Wigglesworth's return was one of the major draws to the season. After all, this was the original Kelly, the original runner-up to the season who was just one vote away from winning the game. She was the epitome of a second chance season. However, her second season would not go nearly as well. Now, she was left out of the first vote where she was part of the old school alliance, which funnily enough included Vetus, who had only played a few seasons before on Blood vs. Water, where she, her side would lose Vetus on the first vote. And while her side would regain the numbers on the following vote, thanks to Jeff Varner flipping, the rest of the pre-merge was pretty unremarkable for Kelly Wigglesworth, both from a gameplay perspective and from a edit perspective, where she was never viewed as a top contender to win the game. And this continued into the merge, where while she did survive a couple of votes, she never voted correctly at any of those tribals, and she was eventually taken out at the final 11. Not quite the finish that she expected, but she at least made it to jury, and sure enough, when it was her turn to speak at Final Tribal, she asked each of the final three to choose a number from 1 to 10. An obvious callback to when Greg asked her that same question way back in Survivor Borneo. But as I alluded to a moment ago, Wigglesworth was not the only Kelly to compete on the season. After just a two-season layoff, Kelly Wentworth was back to redeem herself following her very early exit from Sam on Del Sur, and by many accounts, she delivered upon that, though it was certainly not without its bumpy roads. She did vote in the majority during that first vote to take out Vetus, and was even able to find an idol during the immunity challenge that no one knew about. But by the second tribal, she was already on the outs, trying to target Spencer, but in the process losing one of her allies in Shireen. And she got a pretty bad swap where her and Terry Deeds were the only members of the original tribe on the new Dekeo tribe, and while she was able to build decent relationships with the Bions and was able to go on a pretty impressive immunity streak that allowed her to get all the way to the merge without going back to Tribal, it still wasn't an ideal situation for her to be in. At the merge, Wentworth does find herself in a new alliance with Abby Maria, Sierra, and Kaz, and they do lose out in the first vote, losing Kaz in the process, and things don't look great either at the next tribal, where Wentworth herself is being targeted. However, this time she is able to whip out the idol that she found way back in the premiere, and find herself on the giving end of an idol play, negating 9 votes, breaking the record previously set by Russell when he idled out Kelly Sharba, in the process blindsiding Andrew Savage, Again, one of the most iconic moves in the history of Survivor, and one that's continued to be referenced even to this day. Now, admittedly, the Witch's Coven remain underdogs for a lot of that post-merge, as the Bion Alliance are able to hold true, although they are able to get a one-up on them at a couple tribals, namely the Final Nine, where they're able to blindside Stephen Fishback, and at the Final Six, she's almost able to idle out Jeremy, who was running the game for most of the season, after flipping over Kimmy while Jeremy didn't realize it, and it took a lot of convincing from Spencer to convince Jeremy that Kimmy had flipped, prompting him to use his idol, resulting in a zero votes tribal. And while Wentworth had lost most of her Witch's Coven allies throughout the post-merge, she was the last person standing, getting all the way to the Final Four, where she really had a strong case to win the game, even against Jeremy had she gotten to the end. But after failing to win that final immunity challenge, she gets voted out as a result. So on the whole, she really built upon her Samuel Del Sur game, really realizing her potential and having one of the most iconic runs in Survivor history. But the crazy part is that she wasn't done, where she was brought back one more time in Edge of Extinction, being one of the four returnees from that season. Now, similar to Cambodia, she had a lot of adversity during Edge of Extinction, given her reputation, but also made worse by the fact that she had far less challenge success during the pre-merge, where she went to almost every single tribal during the pre-merge. And during the pre-swap, she was targeted at each of those tribals, getting votes against them. But the crazy part was that she was able to build enough allies, particularly with her fellow attorney and David Wright, to get through a lot of those rounds, and she was able to get all the way to the merge. Upon reaching the merge, despite her original try being down in numbers, she's able to maneuver around a lot of the dynamics there and take out some pretty key players along the way, namely in Eric. 
And despite the target that she had coming into the season, she managed to be the last remaining returning player from that season. Now, eventually her luck did run out when she became too big of a target, but the fact that she was able to make it as far as she did, considering the reputation that she had following Cambodia, is really impressive and speaks to just how great of a player she has become. So all in all, Kelly Wentworth is very much a story of success, where despite her having a very early exit from her original season, she was able to get a second chance and really capitalize on the opportunity, showing the world just how great of a player she was, and the process becoming a Survivor great. And while she has never actually won Survivor, people continue to look up to her, and we hear new players every season talking about how they want to play like her. So all in all, I would consider Kelly Wentworth to be a success story. Now the final Kelly to have played Survivor up to this point is one season later in Island of the Idols, where we have Kelly Kim. And Kelly Kim had a very emotional Survivor experience, where on one hand, she was a very impressive player, where she was in the majority for so much of that pre-merge, be sticking to the majority and being able to get to meet Boston Rob and Sandra and getting an idol from them after hearing their stories about Boston Rob's Harvard parties and Sandra's dogs and what have you. And at the swap, she's able to meet Dean, who has a mutual connection to her outside the game. And she even went as far as to make a big move at the last boat before the merge, where she was able to play an idol on Dean and blindsiding Jack in the process. And for most players, the fact that they're able to say that would indicate that they would have a pretty good time on Survivor. But she also had a very uncomfortable relationship with one of her tribe mates, Dan Spilo, who had a very notorious reputation for having inappropriate contact with a lot of the female competitors. And Kelly seemed to get the brunt of that, where she not only repeatedly told Dan throughout the season to not touch her in that way, and all this came to a head at the merge, where she became very outspoken with her discomfort with Dan's touching, and she even tried to get some of the women on her side to vote against Dan at that first vote. However, things were definitely turning against Kelly, where due to her move to play the idol on Dean, people started to recognize her as a pretty big threat. And with Dan being a more useful piece in the majority alliance at that point, the votes actually flipped against Kelly, resulting in her being taken out at the merge, which to this day remains one of the darkest and most uncomfortable moments in Survivor history. Now, Dan was eventually ejected from the game at the final six due to him touching a production member off camera, and Kelly has been able to talk about her experience during the reunion show. However, none of this is a take away from the mistreatment that Kelly and the other women from Island of the Isles experienced, and how production really dropped the ball in handling Dan's actions and making sure that the women weren't being treated in this way. So really, Kelly is an interesting case because on one hand, she was a good player. She'd had plenty of strong moments during that pre-merge, but her elimination at the merge is not only one of the darkest moments in Survivor history, but really speaks to the bad deal that Kelly got while out there. And while I understand that Kelly Kim may not want to play Survivor again after the experience that she had, myself and a lot of other fans really hope that she gets another chance someday to really highlight her potential as a player just like Kelly Wentworth got on her second chance. When Kelly Wigglesworth came one vote away from winning the very first season of Survivor, it seemed almost inevitable that a Kelly would eventually win. And as we saw more and more Kellys make Survivor history for both better and for worse, it seemed that based on the long history of the show that at some point one of them would win. However, if we look at the sheer history of it, at some point, all 10 Kellys in Survivor history came up short. On average, a Kelly would make it to day 22 before having their torch snuffed, and on average, they would make it to about 11th place. So on any given season, you can expect a Kelly to make it to around the merge point before having their torch snuffed. And if we look at their long track record, they have a clear history of records where on one hand, you have the Kel Gleasons of the world who are the first voted out of their tribe, but then you have people like Kelly Wigglesworth who make it the final tribal. You have people like Kelly Wentworth who are able to get to fourth place before getting cut. And you have virtually every other outcome in between. Now, at the end of the day, Kelly is just a name. It's just something that these 10 players happen to have in common. And yet when you look at just how much history that Kelly's have made across Survivor history, and considering the sheer track record that they've had in terms of winning challenges, playing idols, and making big moves, 
one would think that Kelly's have had one of the biggest impact on the game of Survivor. And yet the fact that none of them have, have won despite their numbers is really fascinating. And at this point, if a Kelly were to win Survivor, that would probably be the least of their accomplishments at this point. But as it stands, we have had 10 Kellys play Survivor through 43 seasons, and yet none of them have actually won. So there we go. That will do it for this week's video. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps out with the channel. And I really want to make more general Survivor content moving forward. I actually have some more ideas like this planned where I talk about other names from Survivor history. So stay tuned for that. And if you haven't already, be sure to join my Discord server, which I'll leave a link to join in the description. There's a lot of stuff coming your way. But for now, that's the video. See ya.